The Yellow Dwarf of the Blue Fairy Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ed Good. The Blue Fairy Book by Andrew Lang. The Yellow Dwarf. Once upon a time there lived a queen who had been the mother of a great many children. And of them all, only one daughter was left. But then she was worth at least a thousand. Her mother, who, since the death of the king her father, had nothing in the world she cared for so much as this little princess, was so terribly afraid of losing her that she quite spoiled her, and never tried to correct any of her faults. The consequence was that this little person, who was as pretty as possible, and was one day to wear a crown, grew up so proud and so much in love with her own beauty that she despised everyone else in the world. The queen, her mother, by her caresses and flatteries, helped to make her believe that there was nothing too good for her. She was dressed almost always in the prettiest frocks, as a fairy or as a queen going out to hunt and the ladies of the court followed her, dressed as forest fairies. And to make her more vain than ever, the queen caused her portrait to be taken by the cleverest painters, and sent it to several neighboring kings with whom she was very friendly. When they saw this portrait, they fell in love with the princess, every one of them. But upon each it had a different effect. One fell ill, one went quite crazy and a few of the luckiest set out to see her as soon as possible. But these poor princes became her slaves the moment they set eyes on her. Never has there been a gayer court. Twenty delightful kings did everything they could think of to make themselves agreeable, and after having spent ever so much money in giving a single entertainment, thought themselves very lucky if the princess said, That's pretty. All this admiration vastly pleased the queen. Not a day passed but she received seven or eight thousand sonnets, and as many elegies, madrigals, and songs, which were sent her by all the poets in the world. All the prose and all the poetry that was written just then was about Bellissima, for that was the princess's name, and all the bonfires that they had were made of these verses which crackled and sparkled better than any other sort of wood. Bellissima was already fifteen years old, and every one of the princes wished to marry her. But not one dared say so. How could they when they knew that any one of them might have cut off his head five or six times a day just to please her? And she would have thought it a mere trifle. So little did she care. You may imagine how hard-hearted her lovers thought her, and the queen who wished to see her married did not know how to persuade her to think of it seriously. Bellissima, she said, I do wish you would not be so proud. What makes you despise all these nice kings? I wish you to marry one of them, and you do not try to please me. I am so happy, Bellissima answered. Do leave me in peace, madam. I don't want to care for anyone. But you would be very happy with any of these princes, said the queen, and I shall be very angry if you fall in love with anyone who is not worthy of you. But the princess thought so much of herself that she did not consider any one of her lovers clever or handsome enough for her, and her mother, who was getting really angry at her determination not to be married, began to wish that she had not allowed her to have her own way so much. At last, not knowing what else to do, she resolved to consult a certain witch who was called the Fairy of the Desert. Now this was very difficult to do, as she was guarded by some terrible lions. But happily the queen had heard a long time before that whoever wanted to pass these lions safely must throw to them a cake made of millet flour, sugar candy, and crocodile's eggs. This cake she prepared with her own hands, and putting it in a little basket, she set out to seek the fairy. But as she was not used to walking far, she soon fell very tired and sat down at the foot of a tree to rest, and presently fell fast asleep. 
When she awoke, she was dismayed to find her basket empty. The cake was all gone, and to make matters worse, at that moment she heard the roaring of the great lions, who had found out that she was near, and were coming to look for her. "'What shall I do?' she cried. "'I shall be eaten up.' And being too frightened to run a single step, she began to cry, and leaned against the tree under which she had been asleep. Just then she heard someone say, <coughs> She looked all around her, and then up the tree, and there she saw a little tiny man who was eating oranges. "'Oh, Queen,' said he, "'I know you very well, and I know how much afraid you are of the lions, and you are quite right, too, for they have eaten many other people, and what can you expect as you do not have any cake to give them?' "'I must make up my mind to die,' said the poor Queen." Alas, I should not care so much if only my dear daughter were married. Oh, you have a daughter, cried the yellow dwarf, who was so called because he was a dwarf, and had such a yellow face and lived in the orange tree. I'm really glad to hear that, for I've been looking for a wife all over the world. Now if you will promise that she shall marry me, not one of the lions, tigers, or bears shall touch you. The queen looked at him and was almost as much afraid of his ugly little face as she had been of the lions before, so that she could not speak a word. What? You hesitate, madam? cried the dwarf. You must be very fond of being eaten alive. And as he spoke, the queen saw the lions which were running down a hill toward them. Each one had two heads, eight feet, and four rows of teeth, and their skin was as hard as turtle shells, and were bright red. At this dreadful sight the poor queen, who was trembling like a dove when it sees a hawk, cried out as loud as she could, Oh, dear dwarf, Bellissima shall marry you. Oh, indeed, he said disdainfully, Bellissima is pretty enough, but I don't particularly want to marry her. You can keep her. Oh, noble sir, said the queen in great distress, do not refuse her. She is the most charming princess in the world. Oh, well, he replied, out of charity I will take her, but be sure and don't forget that she is mine. As he spoke, a little door opened in the trunk of the orange tree. In rushed the queen, only just in time, and the door shut with a bang in the faces of the lions. The queen was so confused that at first she did not notice another little door in the orange tree, but presently it opened and she found herself in a field of thistles and nettles. It was encircled by a muddy ditch, and a little further on was a tiny thatched cottage, out of which came the yellow dwarf with a very jaunting air. He wore wooden shoes and a little yellow coat, and as he had no hair and very long ears, he looked altogether a shocking little object. "'I am delighted,' he said to the queen, "'that as you are to be my mother-in-law, you should see the house in which your Bellissima will live with me. With these thistles and nettles she can feed a donkey which she can ride whenever she likes.' Under this humble roof no weather can hurt her. She will drink the water of this brook and eat frogs which grow very fat about here. And then she will have me always with her, handsome, agreeable, and gay as you see me now. For if her shadow stands by her more closely than I do, I shall be surprised. The unhappy queen seeing all at once what a miserable life her daughter would have with this dwarf, could not bear the idea, and fell down insensible without saying a word. 